Scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take, and divide it among yourself. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf, he took the loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after the supper, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you, and it is the new covenant of my blood. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In this hour, O God, lend me your spirit. Lend every single person here today your spirit. Let the words that are spoken and the words that are heard be yours, not mine. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? So as you can tell, I am neither Pastor Scott nor Pastor Crystal. Uh, Pastor Crystal is going through the uh, commissioning process right now, and she has a big interview next week, so please, please, please pray for her. So we wanted to give her some time away from the pulpit to prepare for that interview. That being said, I'm Andrew Harper. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm the youth pastor here at Swansboro UMC, and I'm excited to be able to introduce the Lenten series. For those of you who may be kind of new to the church lingo, uh, Lent is the season leading up to Easter. And over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about one topic and one topic alone. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus. And if you're not okay with that, I'm sorry, but here we are. Uh, We're going to be following uh, a sermon series called The 24 Hours That Changed the World. This series uh, was written a few years ago by a pastor named Adam Hamilton. He's a United Methodist pastor out of Kansas. He's written loads of books. You might have heard of them. Uh, And if you haven't, well, this is going to be your first exposure to him. Uh, We're going to be following his series pretty closely, but with a little bit of flair from each individual pastor. So you're going to get a little bit of difference from week to week. So the 24 hours that changed the world, the 24 hours that led... To Jesus' death on the cross. So, we have to start on Thursday evening. Thursday evening is really, really significant and sometimes gets passed over on the journey to the cross because the crucifixion is the highlight and then the resurrection on Easter. But Thursday, what happened on Thursday? Jesus looked at his disciples and told them to go into the city of Jerusalem. And he said, go and find a place that we can eat the Passover meal. The Passover meal is one of the holiest things in the Jewish faith. It is still eaten today. Every single year, still eaten. It's one of those things that's not actually eaten in the temple or in the synagogue. It's actually around one's own home table. It's a very intimate and personal thing that's so important to the Jewish people. So you might understand why Jesus is trying to find a good location to have this Passover meal. But what's the history behind this? Sometimes it's really helpful to get a little bit of background info before we get to the story. So let's go back to the first ever Passover. The first one that is ever mentioned in the Bible, the Passover. We have to go back to the Old Testament. The second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is this amazing tale that talks about the Israelites' journey out of slavery into freedom and back into the promised land. But the first half is the entire story of their slavery. You see, uh, 
The Israelites lived in this region called Canaan at first because Abraham got there because God told him that that's where you need to live. And this amazing journey of faith, he left his home and showed up in Canaan. And that's all well and good and he had a family and it grew. And it's this amazing story about how his family populated this region. But eventually, one of his descendants, a guy named Joseph, was sold by his brothers down to Egypt, and there arose a great famine in the land of Israel, of Canaan. And also in the land of Egypt. But Joseph had risen to a position of power, and he managed to save the land of Egypt. He managed to save them from this famine by storing up loads of food, because God gave him this advice. And eventually, you find out that... uh, Joseph's brothers that sold him come down from Canaan, the land that was promised, and end up staying. So not only did Joseph save the land of Egypt from this awful famine, but he ended up saving his own family. So that's how they got from uh, Canaan, Israel, all the way down to Egypt. But there arose a pharaoh in the land of Egypt who forgot what Joseph did. He forgot about this guy who had literally saved his people. And he looked at all these Israelite people. He looked at the people that had been living in his land. And instead of celebrating the fact that they were living there amongst him, he grew afraid. And fear does awful things to people, doesn't it? The Pharaoh looked at these people and said, We are going to enslave them, to oppress them, to make them do harsh labor to curb their population. And when even that didn't work, he looked at his servants and said, Go into the Israelite houses and take the firstborn and kill every single one of them. So eventually, the Israelite people, God's own people, called out to God and said, God, God, please save us from this awful, awful situation that we live in. And God sent a man named Moses. And Moses, one of God's own chosen people that was supposed to die when the firstborns were all killed, when he is a full-grown man, goes to Pharaoh and gives the message that God gave him, says, Pharaoh... Let God's people go. And he says, and I quote, If you don't, the land of Egypt will know that he is God. And of course, if you know the story, Pharaoh doesn't do that. Pharaoh does not let the Israelites go. And sure enough, the ten plagues of Egypt start coming. And the first, the plagues aren't too bad. Flies, gnats, frogs, they're kind of just minor nuisances. Nothing awful. But after each plague, Pharaoh gets a visit from Moses. And Moses says, all you have to do is let God's people go. And each time, Pharaoh says no. Until nine plagues later, eventually, God says to Moses, All right, tell the Israelites, pack up your stuff, get unleavened bread, bread without yeast in it, because it's going to last longer, because y'all are about to leave tonight. Because what's going to happen next, Pharaoh will let you go. And this next part of the story is where the feast actually comes in. The feast of Passover is when God told Moses to tell the people, eat some of that unleavened bread and take a lamb and kill it and eat the lamb. But with the lamb's blood, paint the blood on the door as a sign. And the sign is going to be that when God comes into the land of Egypt, that every single door that does not have lamb's blood, the firstborn child is going to die. Sure enough, uh, Moses gives this message to the Israelite people, and all the Israelites do it. And the funny part of the story is that Moses even gives this message to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh still doesn't listen. God fulfills his promise, and finally Pharaoh relents, and the Israelite people are free. So this is the story that Jesus and his disciples remember. Whenever they eat that unleavened bread, and they eat the lamb of the Passover, 
they remember freedom. They remember that years and years and years ago that God granted their people freedom. So then the question shifts, not from slavery to man, subjugation where they have to build things and they're forced to live in awful conditions, but what are the disciples then enslaved to? They lived under Roman occupation where it wasn't the greatest thing in the world, sure, but they were free to work as they pleased, worship as they pleased. They were all right, but they were still enslaved. And there's one disciple in particular that you can look at to really get the idea of how the disciples were enslaved. A man named Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, we learn from the Bible, is the one that carried the group's money. He would pay for the things that they needed to pay for along the way, the food, the lodging, and he would also give out money to the poor, as Jesus told him. But we also know that Judas would take some of the money from the group and keep it for himself. Instead of helping other people, he would keep it for himself and hoard it. He was enslaved to money to such a degree that he would not even listen to his master's call to feed and clothe the poor. And just a few verses before the ones that I just read, we also know that his drive for money is worse. That his drive for money is so awful that he goes before the priests and the Sanhedrin, these important people in the Jewish faith, and says, How much would you give me if I sold you Jesus? And they say, how about 30 pieces of silver? And he thinks and he says, done. Sold. We don't sell Jesus like that. He is not walking right beside us this very moment. That we can go to someone and sell Jesus to his death. But we do betray Jesus in other ways, don't we? But before we go down that path, um, let's think about how someone would react to being betrayed. There are so many different uh, websites that I was looking through that all you have to do is type in the words revenge or payback. And you come up with these lists and stories of people that are celebrating the fact that they got back at somebody for hurting them, for betraying them. And people commenting on it and saying, oh, they deserved it, or you should have done even worse than that. Or a line from a movie that I know um, someone is crying hysterically because someone has hurt them. And instead of consoling this person or saying, don't worry, things are going to get better, his friend looks at this young man who's crying and says, don't get mad, get even. Or even another story that I read recently about a man and his wife when they were on a cruise. And the wife you find, find a dead. And when the, people, the police interviewed the husband, you find out it was because she was laughing at him too much. This world is a broken place where we always seek revenge. We always seek uh, to get back at somebody who's hurt us. And at this point in the story, we know that Jesus knows one of his disciples has betrayed him. He even says, one of the people at this very table, whose hand is on this table, has betrayed me today. But what does Jesus do? It's one of the coolest things in the scripture, y'all. It's one of my favorite parts. He, sitting at the table, and there's something you need to know about uh, how Roman culture ate. It's kind of weird. And the best comparison I have is how my family used to eat dinner. My dad would sit at one end of the table, my mom would sit at the other, and they always sat there. And then, since I have two sisters, three of us in total, um, two people would sit on one side and one person would sit on the other. And we would rotate depending on who set the table or who helped cook, things like that. Well, in Roman culture, they sat at a U-shaped table. And the people all the way to the far left of that table were some of the most important people. So the person second to the left was the host. The person running the meal. 
So in this case, it'd be Jesus. Jesus was the one hosting this meal for his disciples, trying to show them what the Passover meal was all about. And then on the other side, people speculate that it was probably uh, John, the disciple that Jesus loved. Because there's a a line in a different gospel where John laid his head on Jesus' chest. But who is on the right side of Jesus? There are tons of references in scripture and all throughout Roman culture about sitting at the right hand of someone. Sitting at the right hand is a position of honor. It means you're a valued guest. It means that you are the person that is most important at the party. So who is sitting at the right hand of Jesus? It's Judas. It is the man that has just betrayed the Lord. There's this passage where it talks about who will betray uh, the Lord, and it's the man who will... Jesus will dip his cup with. And in Roman culture, what they would do is they would start at the left and they would serve to the right. So not only was Jesus sitting right next to the person that betrayed him, but he actively turned to him, served him food and drink. And as the passage that we read told you, It wasn't that he was there begrudgingly. It wasn't that he was so sad to be there. No, Jesus eagerly awaited that meal. He wanted to be there more than anything. He wanted to be amongst his disciples, but specifically wanted to be right next to Judas. There is something so powerful in that image. In a culture that drives for vengeance or payback or trying to get even with somebody. We have an example of someone that turns to the man who had just betrayed him and welcomes him and loves him and feeds him instead of trying to get even. And the very next day uh, we read that Judas went to the high priests that he sold Jesus to. And he tries to return the coins. Maybe it's out of a little bit of remorse. Maybe he was trying to even buy Jesus back. But the point is, is that maybe, just maybe, in that moment, Judas was freed from his desire for money. Maybe. We don't know why he did what he did, but we didn't hear from Judas again. So, This entire context, this story of the Passover meal and the importance of freedom and slavery, this dichotomy, this split between freedom and slavery. The important question arises, what are we enslaved to? I'm sure that a lot of us are kind of like Judas. We are enslaved to this drive to get more money. We want more money, we want more property, we want more stuff, we want more. And that's what the society as a whole has taught us, is that we just need more. And that's the best thing in this world. But that's not what Jesus is teaching us. We could be trying to go for uh, more power. We could try to go for a position that's higher than what we are right now. But that's not what Jesus taught either. Because at that very same table, he looked at his disciples and he taught them that if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you have to serve. He went around that very table and he washed their feet like a servant would do. We could be enslaved to the ideas of seeking only pleasure. Seeking only the best and brightest things that this society has to offer. But every single time we look to what Jesus says, He says, be free of that. Be free of the desire for money. Be free of the desire for power and place. No. 
And it's this very subtle uh, split because we always want to jump to forgiveness. We always want to jump to forgiveness when it comes to Jesus. And that's a good thing and we should get there eventually. But before we get there. And Pastor Scott kind of talked about this on the Ash Wednesday service if you were there. Um, The first step in the season of Lent to not sinning is to not sin. (laughs) To try not to do it. And in Jesus we find the freedom to not do that. We all have the things that weigh heavy, that bog us down, that keep us from God. But in Jesus, and at this table, at the Passover table, we find freedom. We find freedom in Christ. Let us pray. God, you are a Lord of freedom, of setting the captives free. Help us to remember the things that keep us from you and help us to distance ourselves from them. Help us to be closer to you. In your name I pray. Amen.